The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. LinkedIn presents. I'm Maura Aarons Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever, the show that looks at the intersection of mental health and work, and how we can all do both better. Here's a dirty word micromanager. When I hear that word, it brings me stress, it makes me anxious, it brings me back to times in my career when I've had extremely demanding bosses or clients. I seemed to never do anything right and I felt like no one trusted me. And the amount of emotional labor it took to actually deal with the micromanaging, frankly, is distracting, right? It distracts you from the energy you have to do your actual job. But if I'm honest, I've been on the flip side of this. I've been the one sending texts to make sure something got done. I've corrected a lot of grammar and typos. And I haven't trusted people enough on my team, no matter how excellent they are. It's not often about them. It's been about me and my anxiety. What I'm getting at here is that micromanaging can be a source of anxiety for so many of us. But micromanagers are also driven by anxiety, by a need to control and succeed or make sure everything is perfect. And they don't do it with bad intentions often. So today we're going to speak with someone who knows a lot about how to mitigate some of these behaviors and help us work better and be more mentally healthy. Julia Milner is my guest. She's a leadership professor at Ed Heck Business School, and she runs the MBA academic program there. We spoke about all the negative effects of micromanaging and how to prevent them. Julia, maybe you want to start by telling the audience a time, if there is one, that you were micromanaged and what it felt like. Oh, gosh, I have to think about this. Yeah, I think there have been a few times in my life where I've been micromanaged. And I think it feels like you have yourself no control. So for me, it feels very limiting in my freedom. I think actually being micromanaged would make me feel or did make me feel anxious. It's kind of like the opposite of empowering. So I think it's important, yeah, to try to gain back some control for yourself. I would agree with you. And and there was a time recently that I was micromanaged and it was about something really stupid. Mm -hmm. It was about something that honestly, you'd be shocked that someone at my age and level would have been managed about the way that a document looked, font choice, things like that. And I felt so angry, but also like I was being treated like a baby, like like I was being infantilized. Mm -hmm. And it enraged me. I guess anger can also be your reaction. (laughs) It depends on where you're at right now. I think what I find interesting, I think we have to distinguish between being micromanaged and receiving maybe critical, constructive feedback. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure for the listeners that you know, we're not going against, you know, providing and receiving feedback, also critical feedback. I think that's really cool. But I think it's about, yeah, the way it's probably transferred and whether you have some room, yeah, to do things differently. And I think what you just described sounds to me like somebody was talking you from the up from the top, <laughs> down towards you. And that's not a nice way to do things, I think. Yeah. How would you define micromanaging? Well, micromanaging, we have different, I think, styles of micromanaging. But overall, I would say it's somebody telling you what to do in detail and you having to execute this step by step without having, you know, any of your input 
but again, there are different styles that I've observed and also came out in my research. And I think there's, for example, one style which I coined motivational micromanagement. Mm. And these managers have the best intentions. So I want to make this very clear. And I think these type of micromanagers are very easy to be helped and to be fixed. But then we have the other extreme where it's really about holding onto power and control. And that can have, yeah, damaging effects, I think, for the receiving party. Absolutely. Yeah. From the person who is being micromanaged yeah. perspective. What are some clues? Like, is it something we just know instinctually or are there clues that we could pick up on when we're sort of being micromanaged? Well, I mean, the clearest way is just you receiving only instructions, you know, do this, do that. Mm -hmm. But again, then there are different levels. So some micromanagers as I mentioned, just the motivational micromanager, for example, they often hide their advice behind closed up questions. So they actually do this with a lot of motivational expressions like, why don't you try this? Or have you not done this? Or how about we go and do it this way? <laughs> so right. these are even some open questions in there as well. So closed and open questions. And they mean well, but I think so these are much harder to spot because you kind of like think, oh, but they're being so nice and they're so motivated to help. <laughs> but in the end, it's, I think, not helping the person receiving the micromanagement, but it's also not helping the micromanager themselves because, you know, we all are just losing so much time and energy and motivation with the style. Right. And it's so prevalent. In one of your articles, you cited that I've seen data that, you know, around 80% of us yeah have experienced micromanage. And the fact that most of us, 85% complain of its negative impact on morale. Yeah. We hate it. But why Why is it so prevalent? Well, maybe let's, if, if it's okay, I start with the part why we hate it. Yes, please. <laughs> so I think I think it, it you kind of like can compare it with diets. So, you know, that there's the latest fat diet out there. So somebody mm -hmm. tells you, eat 20 gram of this at this time of the day and then do that and then do this. And you go like, oh, maybe that's the solution. Maybe that will, you know, give me the solution to all my problems. And then you, you start doing it. And it totally doesn't work. Maybe you can hang on to it if you're very determined for half a day or maybe even a day, and then it completely backfires. And I think like this thought of, you know, fad diets is kind of like the same as being micromanaged because, I mean, it's a bit of a stretch here, I know. <laughs> but I always say this is like why leaders fail and diets don't work because <laughs> diets micromanage you as well, you know? So it's kind of like saying, this, this, and this, and this, you know, very detailed. And that's not how your life operates. This is not how you work. And often, you know, like employees or team members are much closer to an issue. So they're the ones dealing with the clients. They're the ones doing this. But then somebody else who's not even working closely on the project is coming and telling you, do it this way and this way and then that way. Mm -hmm. And this is why it's not very motivating. But if we can bring in our own ideas, our own thoughts, our own perspective and say, okay, let me like think through this and let me find a solution to this. And sure, I mean, you know, we can all add, you know, some, some stuff to it, but that's much more motivating. And so this answers maybe your second part, <laughs> why we hate it so much. But why is it so prevalent? Well, I guess it's kind of like where we came from with leadership. So there was a time, you know, where leaders had to be the expert, or at least they were promoted based on their technical expertise. So right, for example, right. you're so good at doing this job. So, hey, we're going to promote you. And hey, all of a sudden you have a team <laughs> and now you have to lead this team. But often we have not learned how to be leaders. And so it's not being really taught at school. It's not really being taught at, you know, education further along. So it's all like kind of like learning by doing. And it's also, you know, what role models did you have in front of you? And because of all of that, then we often end up in a situation where we want to be good in our leadership position. So how can we do this? Well, we do this by maybe giving advice and giving direction because, hey, <laughs> what else are we in the leadership position for, right? That's right. We have to know the answers, right? Exactly. Exactly. And so this is why I think it's so prevalent. And again, 
a lot of leaders are really good and have the best intentions. They just have not found the right techniques and tools to translate this, like mm -hmm. their good intention, into good leadership behaviors. And this is where you can, you know, do a little bit of work and have great outcomes. So I have a lot of hope. I think <laughs> like a lot of these, like the large percentage of micromanagers can be so easily helped and it's going to make a huge difference to the culture of the organization. What is the experience between anxiety and micromanaging? Do you mean from the receiving end or from the giving end? <laughs> giving. Let's start with giving. <laughs> Let's start with giving. Well, I think micromanaging, if you do it, Again, it does not mean that you are a bad person or you have bad intention. It can mean you care a lot, actually, about your right. team. You care a lot about the outcomes. But you kind of like are holding on to power because you want to control the situation. So you kind of like think, okay, well, in order to do the best for the team and to make it all work, I have to come up with the answer. I have to be in control. I have to manage this all. So let's just do this. Let's give advice. And let's go ahead with it. And I mean, there has been some research from Eskreis Winkler and colleagues, and they actually look into why do people give advice? And it turns out that we are like somehow caught in some we call like the advice trap because people assume that receiving advice is motivating. So they think, oh, hey, if I give you advice, you will receive it and you find this cool. But it's actually not true. <laughs> and they also found that It's motivating for the person giving out advice. So if you give out advice, it seems to be motivating. So mm. and there we have this advice trap. So we think, oh, we like giving it and we believe receiving it is cool. So this is also why we, I guess, <laughs> give it. But um, to link it to your question of anxiety, yeah, I think it's really mostly about trying to control the situation. And again, that's probably not with bad intentions, but we want to control the outcomes so that they turn out good. But It unfortunately doesn't work like this anymore. Absolutely. And when we're anxious, we feel the need to control often. And so that need expresses itself right with the people that we work with, right? It yes, feels natural yes, to me. Yes, 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 absolutely. Why does being micromanaged make us anxious? Well, I guess because in that moment, you are losing control on that other <laughs> end and it's not empowering at all. You, you kind of like sense that the other person is holding on to power and you can't bring in your own thoughts, your own perspective. And I think it's actually really frustrating. I mean, what you described in the beginning, that is frustrating. I mean, you yeah. even said like it made you angry because, hey, I've been working on this or I've been trying to do this and you're not even like listening to my perspective. And the notion of thinking that leaders can be the experts in everything anymore is just not working, not with artificial intelligence, <laughs> not with the pace we are moving and changing. It's just not possible. So no. we are actually focusing on something that does not work anymore. And we have to rather equip leaders with empowering techniques. So we have to help leaders to have conversations and use tools and techniques that empower others. And that does not mean that leaders are not doing anything anymore. And I think that's kind of like another anxiety piece that comes in. So leaders then think, well, then I'm not needed. And so if I'm not needed, then I have no place in being in this leadership that's position. Right. But I'm trying to say, no, leaders, you are very much needed And we are actually desperately needing more good <laughs> leaders in this world. So please, please, please do this, but invest in those techniques. And I'm talking about, to make it more concrete, I'm talking about empathy. And empathy is something we also have to learn how to display it because of a lot of people struggle with it. I'm talking about questioning techniques. I'm talking about listening techniques. I'm talking about giving constructive feedback. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about goal setting solution oriented approaches. These are all skills and techniques that leaders should learn and investigate in. I want to go through each of those techniques. One of the things that was really interesting to me is that you cite that a common outcome of micromanaging is a lack of dialogue in meetings, yes. right? That even if it seems like there's dialogue, right? Those closed questions, it's not true dialogue. It's prescriptive. No. That surprised me. Yeah, and maybe I start off with an example of that's okay for Please. you. So it's kind of like if, if let's say you and I, we go out for dinner and we say, 
hey, do you want to split dessert? And you say, yeah, okay, sure, let's split a dessert. And then I go to you and I say, oh, Maura, don't you think that the chocolate cake over there looks like the best dessert in this whole restaurant? Don't you think we should get it? I've been asking you questions, right? I mean, I have not told you we should get this chocolate cake, <laughs> but how much room for movement do you think there is? I am not going to ask for the apple crumble. That is true. <laughs> Yes. And that's kind of like the same thing that is happening here with like close questions or leading questions. So I'm hiding my advice or my wish or my instruction behind those close questions. So this is the same as asking, have you not thought about this or have you tried out that? And that's not a true dialogue. That is me hiding my direction behind questions. Well, but let me push back here for yes. a sec, because sometimes that is an honest question. Have you thought about calling the vendor and asking them to push up their dates for a week? That's a question. No, for me, it's advice. You want me to call the vendor because you think it's a good thing for me to do to call the vendor and to ask them to push it back. You are not asking me hey, Julia, what do you think, what, what options do we have? Or, hey, Julia, what have you tried so far? Or, hey, Julia, what do you think matters for the client or the vendor? You do not actually let me include any of my experience, my thoughts, or my work that I have done on the project there. What a better way to be, how do you think we should deal with this deadline, have an honest dialogue, and then yes. say, have you thought about calling the vendor? I would even push one or not. more back. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so absolutely, I think that would be a great start to the conversation. And then I would say, let's listen. Let's first listen and let's really listen what comes up. Because how do we know that your suggestion of pushing the vendor back by a week is actually the best way to go about it? How do we know? How do you know? And as soon as you push that in, you are, you know, you are leading there. Now, I mean, we have to be careful here because not all situations are conducive to what I call of an empowerment dialogue. So mm -hmm. if there's really, let's say, an emergency situation or let's take this deadline and it's it's crucial for the project and also you really need to tell me that this needs to happen, but then tell me that this needs to happen. Then don't hide it behind a close question, you know, then rather explain and be transparent about your motivation. So, you know, then rather say to me, as a leader, hey, look, this is the pressing deadline. At the moment, I can't have any other way, but we have to push this back. And then at least, you know, include me into how do we best approach the vendor to tell them that we have to push it back, you know, but then you are right. at least are transparent about this. But other than that, you are just, you know, like you're hiding it and you're actually hindering the true dialogue. So yes, ask an open-ended, really open-ended question. Be really interested and curious about the perspective of the other person. Then listen, listen truly what comes up and then go with that. And if you have to add in your perspective, then say it and express it and be transparent about that. And if If you have limiting, you know, influencing factors, then also be transparent about this. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing, new currencies come and go, decades of savings lost in days, all showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise. A promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. A promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. So let's come back to the points that you make. You've written that merely telling your manager, please stop micromanaging me, doesn't help. <laughs> no. So you have tips from your research that you've developed, and I'd love you to go through those and tell us why this methodology can be helpful? Mm. Well, I think, you know, just telling somebody to stop a behavior they're not even really aware about <laughs> <laughs> right. can be quite can be quite offensive. So I think there are lots of ways to approach it. So 
first of all, you can give positive feedback when your leader actually does include you or does empower you. So, you know, I would first of all start by, hey, I really liked it when you asked for my perspective or that's really cool when you were asking me that open-ended question or I really appreciate. So I would go first with some positive <laughs> highlights. <laughs> Often, <laughs> you know, that already helps people to go like, oh, okay. But if you want to be more, you know, express more how it affects you, then use a concrete example, but also explain how that might be hindering, you know, your own development or input and so on. I think we can do this. But I would always start with, hey, do you mind if I give you some feedback regarding the last project? So, I mean, you can also, as a team member, go in and offer you feedback because then you also know, is it a good situation? Because sometimes if your boss is totally under stress and has a million things and you go like, hey, I want to now talk to you about this, then they're not very receptive to it. So this right. is what I would do. But again, we have to, I think, distinguish between more the motivational micromanager, which is, by the way, often really willing and keen to to learn, to change, to grow. They want the best for their team. So they're actually really open to it. So what we're talking about is like empowering techniques, coaching techniques, or so leaders using coaching techniques. And we found that most people can learn it really quickly and mm. have a really cool outcome and increase in their coaching skills, such as listening, questioning, and so on. But most of them actually had to learn it. So it was very rare that somebody is, you know, naturally gifted. Yes, it's easier for some uh, than for others, right. but most actually had to learn it and you learn it best by trying it out observing also observing and analyze your own communication interactions for example by you know recording it video recording a short sequence with the permission of the other person of course and then analyzing it and then trying it out again and of course being open to some new techniques and you know going through them and learning them but yes it's absolutely possible to do this very quickly could you quickly define what adopting a coaching mindset means and what it might look like? Yes, a coaching mindset means letting the other person arrive at their own solution. Mm. It does not mean laissez-faire, sitting back, doing nothing, but it means supporting them with coaching techniques such as questioning, listening, empathy, goal setting, and so on to arrive at their own solution. And again, you already said it, sometimes you have to be the boss and that's fine. So not all situations are coaching situations, but I would really challenge leaders because I would say in 90% of the cases, there is an opportunity to coach and you're not taking it. And leaders are often not taking it because they say, oh, I'm time poor or I have to be in control or this is what I'm the boss for. But these are what I would call thinking errors because <laughs> if you you are constantly in the micromanaging mode, even if it's the motivational micromanaging mode, you are actually losing time because you're creating bottlenecks for every little decision making. People have to come to you so you have no time to focus on strategic tasks. So right. I think it's much wiser <laughs> to invest into these coaching techniques, which might take a little bit of time in the beginning, but then you will long term save time. One of your other pieces of advice from your research is to be specific and clear about what you want from your manager, the person yes. who is micromanaging. Again, I think not every leader is aware that they are micromanaging. <laughs> so I think if you can be more specific what you need from them, it actually helps to create this dialogue. So for example, you can go in and say, hey, I want to run an idea by you. Would it be okay if you just listen for two minutes and then please ask me one open-ended question with what is unclear or ask me one question that helps us trigger the benefits or, you know, like I think it, it helps sometimes to, <laughs> to give a little bit of an instructional manual so that the other person has an opportunity also to see how it could be differently and how it could help you. And then again, give the positive feedback if that helped you, you know mirror that back and say, hey, that was really cool. Your question really helped me re appreciate it because I was able to, you know, share my viewpoint or whatever it is. Yeah. Wow. No, but that takes a lot of psychological safety. Yes. Yes, indeed. And that's why I'm also warning people. So if we are not talking on the spectrum about the motivational micromanager, but more about the control power hungry micromanager it's not only scary but not necessarily safe yeah. so you have to also then think about 
well, depending how long this has been happening and how severe it is, to maybe get human resources included or some support from peers and so on. Absolutely. So we have to be mindful here. So I don't want people <laughs> to, <laughs> you know, or wildly go out there. But I think, yeah, there are lots of motivational micromanagers who are actually really open and they would appreciate some constructive feedback. And so you have another piece of advice that it seems to me might be good when you do have that controlling sort of yes. not motivational, which is to focus on solutions instead of just presenting a problem. Yes. Some managers are probably quite annoyed because all they have to do is solve problems. <laughs> so so they, they only get presented oh, yes. problems, only get presented complaints, only things that are not working. Right. And they just want to get it off their desk. Exactly. Sometimes it's so much easier as a manager. And frankly, I think about my life as a mother and a wife, you know, mm -hmm. also you're so overwhelmed. It's just yes. easier to say, do this, this and this done. Yeah. I don't need to think about it anymore. Yeah. So, and that's why it can be really helpful to already come with solutions. Mm -hmm. So you actually kind of like counteract the micromanaging in that way because you say, okay, here's the problem, but here are already three solutions I've thought about. And so then you can also help creating this dialogue because then it's not on the leader to sit there and micromanage you, but you already have, you know, three things you were thinking about. So sometimes that can absolutely help to start the conversation. I really like that. And then another piece of advice is to have them ask you questions. And yes. you could start by saying, what are you thinking after you're hearing me talk? This is really interesting to me. Yes. So so I think powerful questions are really crucial <laughs> for both sides. <laughs> so if you as an employee or a team member come up with really cool questions after you maybe presented something, that also can help you get the answers or permission or confirmation from your leader. So think about it. So what was the one thing you did not understand in my presentation? Or what do you think was the highest potential in my presentation? How would you summarize what I just said? You know, even just to check, hey, were you listening? <laughs> Sometimes I ask, actually, I, I might say, what makes you nervous about this? Oh, yes. I love that. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Or what makes you excited or what makes you, yeah, absolutely. If you feel that you have a motivational micromanager, mm -hmm. what is the best way and when and how to, to give them that feedback? Because it still might be hard to hear. Yeah. So again, don't let the other person lose their face. So which which means really ask, you know, first of all, hey, would you mind if I share some feedback with you? I think it's very important to ask for permission. I think for the other person to be willing to receive it. I would also make sure that it's a good time for them. So, you know, even ask, hey, is this a good time? Or when would be a good time? When can we schedule in maybe five minutes? I would love to share with you some, you know, some of my thoughts. And I think that's also something to do, like phrase it in a way that it's not threatening. You know, right. if you say, I need to give you some negative feedback about how you're treating me. <laughs> well, that's not very helpful. But hey, would you mind if I share some of my thoughts and some of my perspective regarding, you know, this project? And then... And as I said before, I think it's helpful if you continuously praise, if you see something that your leader is doing well and that's working and that's empowering, hey, mention it to them, you know, even in a short interaction, send a, send a message or, hey, I really appreciated how you, and then, you know, express that. So I think that works. Mm -hmm. And don't overload the other person. So don't give like five things that, you know, <laughs> needs to change and so on. I think that's too much. And of course, though, we have to also look for creating this feedback culture. And I would really, yeah, encourage your leaders uh, to, to step up and to, you know, not wait one time per year to have your performance feedback where you can't change anything and it's too late, but rather see it as a constant, you know, conversation that you can have. You know, there are no mistakes. There's like trying and, you know, that's important. Trying things out, learning from it, adapting and moving on. Otherwise, we can't survive in this, you know, climate that we are in. So... It's so true. I think also you could be a little bit humble, you know, like, and, and I'm able to do this because I talk about anxiety all the time, but I'll be like, you know, I'm, I'm a really anxious person and I always assume it's my fault. So this is what you could do to help me. 
Yeah. You know, this is the feedback that might help me. This is, you know, I think also if, if you have that kind of relationship, if you're willing to frame it in, maybe this is what would help me help you. Ooh, I love this. Absolutely. I think that's very nice. Mm -hmm. I would also say, don't think so much about feedback, rather think about feed forward. So the problem with feedback is feedback sits in the past. It already happened. We can't change it. And this is why often what I call a boxing back effect happens. So, you know, you get a piece of feedback, like uh, I could say, you talked way too fast in your your podcast. And then you go like, okay. (laughs) I well, I think our conversation was so flowing. I I thought you know you were up to speed with me because what what else can you do? You know, it already happened. The podcast is over. Oh God, like, Julia, is that true? And I feel terrible. Oh no, <laughs> it's not true. I just made this up. Okay. <laughs> I love the sweet. <laughs> okay. But it it sits so again. Feedback sits in the past, you know. Yeah. Um, but if I use more feed forward, and let's say this would be true, and again, Mora, it is not true. But let's say it would be true for one moment. I could say, hey, Mora, next time for you next podcast, I would encourage you to speak a tad slower Mm -hmm. so that the other person can take a moment to reflect upon your fantastic questions. Mm. So then you still might say, oh, no, thank you, but I disagree. But at least you can decide what to do with this feed forward gift, whether you want to take it on board next time. And your mind is already focused then on the next time. You're not dwelling on the past. You're not getting anxious about what happened. And you're not living in regret because next time you could do it differently if you would want it to. Mm, I love that feed forward. Okay, as we round out, I want to talk about what to do if you are the micromanager. You know, this is this is the fact. Many of us will be the micromanager. Yeah. How do you treat yourself with grace? Yes. So I want to give a big shout out to all the motivational micromanagers. Okay. You are great people. Okay. And you want the best. And I really appreciate all you're doing for your team and all your consideration. So I think this is very, very important to say because somebody has to say this. So these are great people. Okay. Um, And there's nothing shameful about it. It's actually fantastic that you are looking into this. So big round of applause for you. Okay. So now next step is yeah, be kind to yourself in this process as well. But do look closely, okay? So don't don't fall into the trap of saying, oh no, this is not me. I'm not a micromanager. This is not me. No, no, no. Because I think it can happen much quicker <laughs> than what we think. And I mean, the statistics you named in the beginning mean... They are us. We, we are, are us. us. We yes. are us. <laughs> and then really invest into you know, just learning these smaller skills um, and how you do it, it's totally up to you. Maybe you want to read a book, maybe you want to listen to a podcast like now, but I think it's all about also asking for feedback or feed forward as we learned today. (laughs) Ask for feed forward and also focus on only changing always one thing at a time. So maybe Hmm. focus, you know, next month on your questionings and maybe, you know, take five minutes per week to just journal quickly okay how did I go with my questioning and what do I want to try out next week I think it's very easy to just go with what do I want to do more of and what do I want to do less of in order to move towards this empowering leadership style and really again remember yourself why are you doing this because the why is the values and what drives and what matters and I can tell you motivational micromanagers have the best intentions as I said so Mm -hmm. they are caring Mm -hmm. We just have to find a different vehicle (laughs) for showing that care. I think that's important. (laughs) You're reminding me in my Jewish family, we show that we care through guilt, anxiety, and Mm. fussing over people, basically Mm. micromanaging. Do you have your coat? Are you sure you're not going to be cold? Are you hungry? Mm. I'm not sure you ate enough. And we joke about it, but really it is something that we can all work on a little bit more. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. And again, it all starts, I think, with empathy, you know, yeah. put yourself into the shoes of the other person and, you know, show some care. I think today I saw a great post from Professor Adam Grant and he said, 
Authenticity without empathy is being selfish, and it's so true. Oh. So, really, remind everybody it all starts with empathy. And actually, this is also what came out of my research. You know, those leaders who were the best in improving on their empowering skills, they're those who had empathy down pat. So if you have to invest into anything, invest into showing empathy. And I know that all these motivational micromanagers, they do have empathy. It's just about how do we show it? Don't be intimidated by digital and hybrid work. Mm -hmm. Like really look into how you can do this. Empathy, way to go. Mm. I think I'll leave it there. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maura. <laughs> That's it for today. Our show is produced and edited by Mary Dew. Our assistant producer and sound engineer is Nick Krinko. Many thanks to the LinkedIn Presents family and to all our guests for sharing their stories. If you love the show, tell your friends. I would love you to leave a review because they really matter in helping the show get found. You could also follow us or subscribe. If you have a question for me or you want to submit an idea for the show, find me on LinkedIn, where you can follow me, message me, I promise I'll write back, or subscribe to my newsletter for more from the anxious achiever world. Thanks for listening. 